All right, can you see my BS code? Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we'll continue our session on uh, uh, introduction to machine learning with Python. Um, so for those that join us today, um, we are following the book um, Introduction to Machine Learning with Python from Columbia University, um, where we share the slide, uh, the link in the slide. And I think um, if we look at the course again and see where machine learning Python. Andrew Muller. Let me see Andrew Muller. So this is the person. So this is the um oh no. This is his page. Uh where is the course? Ah, okay, this is the course. So um if anyone has trouble um installation of getting started because at this moment, we expect like while we are working, so you are also practicing the code on your computer. So if you have trouble installation of anything, let us know. So immediately after the session, I can have a session with um, anyone so that we can see how we can uh, um, actually get it running. So um, this is the course we are following on. And um, um, I think what we'll be discussing today, because this is just about visualization, you understand, and we'll discuss this today a little bit, but we are going to discuss uh, start discussing supervised learning. So um, I urge you to read, um, if you have not read, from introduction to uh, supervised learning uh, within this week, uh, you get a lot. Um, he ex did a good explanation. But not only that, um, we are also following, this is the book. So for me, I'm following the, this book, Introduction to Machine Learning with Python, which is a very um, simple um, introduction to Python where we'll be using a top-down approach where we don't actually dive into the details of the algorithm and mathematical behind it. Uh, maybe after we finish this one, we can move on to other books uh, that go deeper into the machine learning. But the idea is just to get intuition on how machine learning can work. So you can do machine learning uh, on your data without stuff like that. So those are the chapters we are working on. So right now we finished chapter one. We are now gonna start chapter two, which is supervised learning. And we go through like this. But also there is another book that is given that you can uh, uh, pair with this, which is applied predictive modeling, which is also very good. Uh, so you can see there the chapters and also different part, part one, it covers this, some stuff like that. And the course um, actually, as I explained, uh, give a good reading. So if you we are gonna do discuss, if we are going to discuss this chapter, you do uh, this reading. ILMP means introduction to machine learning with Python and AMP means applied predictive modeling. So this is uh, what we, uh, so after we finish this book, we're gonna move together like to do much neural network or deep learning, some stuff like that. You can see other books, deep learning with uh, deep learning. So uh, the basic idea now is for us to get intuition of what machine learning is, then we can move on. So let's get started. So for those that actually have missed our first sessions of uh, doing machine learning, uh, Python, where we uh, do a lot of Python, uh, I will share this notebook. You can get this link to see some tutorials that you can actually um, learn a bit and get along. But even if you actually, um, so uh, you don't know a lot of Python, we can learn along the way. Uh, just um, what you need is consistent practice. Uh, but uh, before we move on to continue, uh, let me make some kind of um, important distinction between some concepts. So someone was asking me, what is the difference between machine learning and deep learning? So um, uh, as you can see from this picture, we have the broader picture is called AI. And the second one is called machine learning. And there's something inside is called deep learning. So who can tell us the difference between the two, uh, the machine learning and deep learning? Anybody can volunteer to tell us the difference between machine learning and deep learning. Anyone can volunteer? So um, uh, machine learning, uh, uh, as we said, it, um, the ability to learn without explicitly being programmed, just like not um, where we provide rules. But deep learning is a subset of machine learning. But what 
in tells is deep learning. What is the difference between deep learning and machine learning? Thing we say deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So uh, deep learning, uh, as here it says, is a subset of machine learning based on artificial neural networks. So um, uh, machine learning, we have many kind of algorithms that we use to do, to do machine learning, like um, KNN, K nearest neighbor, support vector machine, a lot of things. But there is what is also called um, uh, neural network, artificial neural network. So deep learning is a kind of machine learning that uses artificial neural networks. Yes, it's a kind of machine learning that uses artificial neural network. We see. But the main difference between machine learning and deep learning is this. So this is a machine learning. Uh, so for example, you want to do classification of car. This is a car and uh, you want to uh, specify whether it is a car or not. You are given a picture uh, or you are given an email that is this an, a spam or not a spam. So in machine learning, what we do, we do what is called future extraction. For example, in machine learning, you remember we said the example we did yesterday, um, the flower, it has some features. For example, the sepal length, the sepal width, the petal length, the petal stuff like that. You remember all those features? Then when we are doing machine learning, where we give emphasis or where we first extract, use some features, then we classify that stuff. That is called machine learning. Yes. Given flowers, before we do machine learning, we need to have a kind of features that tells us what this object is. So for example, if it is a car, we want to classify a car. So we will have like a, a, a tire, um, a bonnet, we'll extract all those features. So when you see this feature, you are given a picture, you see a tire, you see a bonnet, you see, um, uh, what do you call, what other features of a car? Then when you see all these features, then you can say, uh, this is a car. That is machine learning. But deep learning, you don't give any future. No, you only give it the data. Just like Macau, you don't need, you just give it the data and ask the algorithm, tell me what is this. Then deep learning do future extension and class the learning algorithm do this. But this one, human does future extraction. So we tell the algorithm, these are some features, tell us what this is. But deep learning, you don't tell the, um, the machine. That is why uh, uh, machine learning is somehow kind of um, uh, future, um, we say we don't do any future extraction. So these are some of the uh, difference between uh, deep learning. And so you look at it again, this is machine learning. So you have your input, you extract some features from the input and you give it to the learning algorithm to classify what is the output. Um, so, uh, but deep learning, this is the input. Right, this is the input, but all oh, this one, the future instruction and learning, it is the, what the future instruction and learning is neural um, uh, networks, is this uh, neural, artificial neural network is the one that does future instruction and learning. So here we human beings, we actually spend time doing future instruction, but in neural network, you don't need any future instruction, you just give it to this. So that is the basic difference between machine learning and deep learning. Any question before we continue? Right. So um, having now understand what the difference between machine learning and deep learning, let's go on and start um, our chapter that we'll be talking about. So today the chapter we'll discuss is the um, this chapter two, uh, which is um, supervised learning. So we'll talk about supervised learning, but we'll not finish, but uh, because there is a lot of stuff we we'll discuss, um, then we you can see many machine learning algorithms. So I add you the essence where I'm following this book, all what I'm doing in this notebook is just a summary of this talk. You will see it at the same thing, just I'm taking some kind of good point, just putting it and discuss. So when you are following the book, you will understand a lot. So what we'll be discussing today is just to understand the supervised learning algorithm and look at how you can load some data, toy data set from SKLAN and train some simple uh, KNN algorithm. So let's move on. Since this is a supervised learning. So what is supervised learning? Um, supervised learning in machine learning is one of the most commonly used and successful types of machine learning. So um, it may turns out that when you have problem you want to work on, maybe in your project, master's thesis or PhD, 
it may turn out that the problem you want you want to solve will naturally fall into supervised learning. So because this is most widely used um, algorithm that is used machine learning. Um, so it's used whenever we want to predict a certain outcome to perform given input, and we have examples as we have seen in last week and yesterday. Um, for you to do uh, supervised learning is when you have some examples and the, the output. And so this is just a good analogy on how supervised learning works. Um, so for example, it says, uh, imagine you um, a computer is a child and uh, we as a supervisor, you are the father or a teacher and want the child to learn how to differentiate what is pig and what is not pig. Now, what we can do is this, we will show the child, this is pig and tell him, this is pig. And now we tell another picture, we take another picture, this is cat. Then we say not a pig. Then we take another picture, which is a pig. This is pig. We keep iterating this, telling this, this is pig, not pig, pig, not pig. And it turns out that um, when we now finish that, when we take another picture and give it to this um, child, you will be able to tell us this is pig or this is not a pig. So this is called supervised because it has a supervisor. We are the guardian, we supervise all teacher. That is supervised learning. So if we, we show the class example and tell what it is. That is what is supervised learning. And it turns out that there are many kinds of supervised learning. Um, two, the fourth, uh, we have what is called classification and regression. So supervised learning falls into these two categories, regression and classification. So what is regression? Regression is when you have, like you are predicting something which is uh, kind of um, uh, not a category, uh, a value, some kind of running values, like um, you want to predict the salary of someone, you want to predict like um, uh, the height, the length, something like that is called regression. But um, you can see this, we are predicting the temperature, this is called regression task. But also you may want to do uh, classification. Uh, so in classification, what we do is we do like category, um, this is cold, this is hot. So this, you can see this is um, classification. So this is basically two types of um, uh, supervised learning we have and um, we will take one of them classification and see how it works and uh, when we finish then we can talk uh, about regression um, so uh, especially many of us as well um, a lot of problem falls into classification for example you want to do sentiment analysis you want to say classify whether this is um, uh, the sentiment is positive or negative you want to classify hate speech whether this is hate or not you want to classify whether this is uh, the disease is cancerous or not. So you can see a lot of problem falls into classification. Um, so yeah, so let's move on with classification. Any question before we continue? If you have question, ask question before we continue. All right, no question. All right. Okay. Let's move on. Um. So the classification as well um falls into two categories as well. So you can see we will dive in with many terms. We will talk, be talking about many different kinds of terms. So uh, that's why I said that you should take note of this term. Uh, you will be familiar with them so that you will not be confused. So classification can be divided into two. We have what is called binary classification and multi-class class, class, classification. So for example, this, you have two items, you want to divide them into two. For example, you want to divide something into uh, you want you are doing sentiment analysis. You want to define whether this is positive or negative. That is called a binary classification. Binary means two. You are dividing into two. But also you can do uh, multi-class classification. For example, you are classifying a tweet um, into positive, negative, neutral. You can see how many classes we are classifying here. We are classifying into three class: positive, negative, neutral. Or you can do another classification: positive, negative, neutral mixed can you see how many four classes that is called multi-class classification so some problems will, uh, will fall naturally into uh, uh, so some problem will naturally fall, uh, falls into um, multi-class or binary class classification um, so you should take note before you start doing your classification you ask yourself which kind of classification am I going to do binary or multi-class and the algorithm that works on binary class may not work on multi-class classification. There are, so you should know what kind of problem you have. You remember I said the first thing in machine learning is to frame your problem. When you frame your problem, this is one of the examples you are doing binary classification. 
or you are doing multi class classification, then it depends on which kind of classification you have, which algorithm you select to solve your problem. Yes, so that is um, binary class. So you can see here we said some algorithms are designed for binary classification program, not multi classification program. So example in logistic linear again perceptual and survival dimensions. So this you can see they are designed for uh, this stuff. But also some you should also know that um, this is a good point. Some algorithm can be used both for classification and regression. So sometimes you see logistic regression. We say we do regression. Logistic regression we see we do binary classification. So it turns out that this algorithm they can be used for both. Uh, by uh, classification and regression, but they will have different parameters or some kind of different setting to do uh, that. Um, so, um, but um, even if a, an algorithm is binary classification, if an algorithm is binary classification, will we can use some kind of heuristic method which will select that it can also adapt and use multi class program. So, what I'm saying is that uh, some algorithms are naturally fit only into binary class, but there is some heuristic. When we say heuristic, um, some technical, some kind of, um, I don't know, uh, who has English degree here to tell us what is heuristic in, in Hausa. So when we say heuristic, some kind of um, not um, straightforward approach, yeah, so uh, that we can use um, to solve the problem. That is using called one versus rest and one versus all. We'll see these approaches that we so, but for now, just know that um, classification can be binary or multi class. That is it. Um, any question before we move on? Ask question if you have. Falalu. Do you have questions? No, but uh, the sound seems low. I don't ah, know okay. whether. Right, the sound seems low. Okay, let me see whether I can increase the volume. Can you hear me now? Very well, yes. Is it better? It's better. Right, good. Thank you for letting me know that. So um, now we understand um, that um, in machine learning, we have two kinds of machine learning. We have classification and um, we have supervised and unsupervised and supervised is divided into two classification and regression and now we want to do classification first but we also say classification divided into two binary class and multi class classification um so let's go on let's discuss some one concept called generalization so you see today we'll introduce a lot of terms that will be used in machine learning so what do you mean by generalization so um in machine learning the goal of our model is to generalize well from the training data to any unseen data from the same domain. So what we mean by this is this. So when we have a training data and we train the model, and now we bring new data that was not trained on, and then machine learning algorithm make a good prediction, then what you will hear in machine learning community is that the model generalizes well. So when you say generalization, we mean the model generalizes from if it performs good on training data, then it performs good on test data. That is, it generalizes from training data to test data. So generalization refers to how well the concept learned by machine learning model apply to specific example not seen by the model when it was learning. So when you do training on different data sets and the model learns and you want to see whether it generalized, then you test it on different data set and you see that it makes, we want to see whether this is cancer or not and the model um, predict this is a cancerous and which is also, which is of course a cancer cancerous image, then you can say the algorithm generalized. So if a model is able to make an accurate prediction on unseen data, we say it is able to generalize from training set to test set. And the goal of machine learning to build a model that is can generalize as possible accurately. Um, but also 
um, there are some terminologies that we um, arise when we are talking about um, machine learning algorithm or model generalized or not. So when the machine learning generalized, I mean, it learned very well, it can make good prediction. But how about when it does not generalize? That is, um, the machine learning algorithm learns very good on training data, but fails to make good prediction on test data. Or the machine learning algorithm fit the data very well. So we have two concepts that we call overfitting and underfitting. So um, overfitting, these are two related, uh, biggest cause of poor performance of machine learning. So in machine learning, these are the two issues that you will hear a lot talking. Yeah, under, uh, under overfitting and underfitting. So um, I, I believe we, um, someone here, can somebody tell us um, what is an overfitting and underfitting, if you know? Briefly, uh, if you have an idea what is overfitting or underfitting. Okay, overfitting is um, when the training set performs excellently mm -hmm. and, um, the, and the test set now performs um, below, like at maybe like training set is like maybe 90 something percent. Mm -hmm. And your test set is giving you like maybe 50%. Okay, that is what? That's over. Okay, that is underfitting. That is overfitting. Like they deviate. In the graph, you see that one is above, far, far above the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if I'm making any. So, sense. so what, what about the other one? The underfitting. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can explain underfitting very well. But I know it's also. I'm sorry, sir. Let, let me just leave it at that. Okay, who can explain also? Uh, I think overfitting is a situation whereby the model learns the features as well as the uh, as the noise in the in the in the in the features. Right. So let's go on. So we said <laughs> overfitting and underfitting are the two biggest causes for poor performance of machine learning algorithm. So when you train your machine learning algorithm, the algorithm may perform well or not. So when it's actually not performing well, there are some causes to that. Um, when it's also uh, fitting the data very well, there are some causes to that. So these two concepts are called um, and, um, uh, uh, underfitting and uh, overfitting. So what is underfitting? fitting and um, what is overfitting uh do i put them in? all right so there is what we call model complexity um i have not put um um because we are not showing the mathematical concept behind uh the stuff there is what we have what's called the model complexity um so when we have overfitting i mean underfitting um so when we have our machine learning algorithm you can see here uh, we have what is called model, comp maybe in the next session, I will show the a little bit about mathematical behind this, uh, but here there is no one. So when we have model complexity, you can see uh, here at the model is not, uh, it's not so complex. We have a problem here that is called underfitting. Is That is the accuracy of the model. You can see the accuracy of the model is not large. So uh, when we train the, mo much, uh, the model, and um, maybe it lands good on the training data, but when we test on uh, when we try on test data, it fails to generalize. It doesn't work. It works on training data, but it doesn't generalize on test data. That is, it is what we call underfitting. But we also have what is called um, overfitting. Um, yeah, I need to show you the mathematical stuff. I mean, I, I, I need to show the mathematical. I will come back to this so that uh, I will show the mathematical so that you understand it better, uh, the two concepts. Let me continue. I will come back to that um, because I need to show you the complexity uh, of how the model is uh, from the function that is work. So that when you have more, uh, your, your model is so complex, then it, you have some stuff like that. I will come back to that. Just, um, excuse me. Um, so, uh, um, the next thing we will discuss here is um, uh, the effect of more data sets. The effect of more data sets. Oh, okay, I think um, I can 
show the the complexity yeah what I, I wanted to show here maybe I, I think this guy in his slide show it yes or oh, something like that yeah okay yeah maybe something like this so um you can see here uh here also okay uh, maybe this is not well uh model complexity overfitting underfitting yeah so yeah there's no uh, all right maybe this is the same example as well but there is no mathematical intuition there so um this um the same example uh but overfitting is when you have your data sets and the um, the model is so complex and your data set, data set is so small and the model fit the data very, very well. Yeah, okay, there's another one here. Yes, 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 let me see this one. Let's show, let me show you this one. Mm -hmm. Oh no, this is not opening. So I, can you see here? Can you see this one? Can you see? So um, here you can yes. see here. Okay, yeah. For example, this one. So here we have our classification and you can see here, um, we have like um, uh, training. We have two class, right? We have two class here, right? And we have something red and we have, is it blue, right? You can see it classified the data into two. This is different, this is different, right? But is this classification good? Does it classify very well? No. No, it doesn't classify very well, right? Because you can see yes. it does, this is called underfitting. When your model is not okay. classifying very well, this is called mm -hmm. underfitting. Mm -hmm. But this is called maybe optimal fit. What we say optimal, that is maybe what we want. So you can see, what about this one? Is it, does it classify very well? No. Mm, yes. Eh? Yes, it no, does. No, but we still have. Yes, does. we still have, but it's not as worst as this one, right? Yes, yes. yes. Then this is what we want, optimal fit. Okay. Even, even you as human being, you can do some mistakes. You yes. may not be 100%. Excellent. You can, yes. Yes. You can see it's yes. only two here. It's only two that does not actually. So this is what we want. This okay. is underfitting. Okay. Under, it does not fit the data very well. This is mm. optimal fit. Optimal, that is okay. what we want. Like so, But this is uh, over, yeah. overfit. What do you mean by overfit? overfit? It, it means... Because it excellently done. Excellently, yes. Excellently. So yes. you can see here, it's trying to uh, classify the data very, very well. Yes, yes. And when it classifies, so what is happening here is that maybe you have very small data and you have very mm. complex model, very gigantic, yes. so complex model. So there are different mm. kind of algorithm models. So the model is so complex that it fits mm -hmm. the data very, very mm -hmm. well. Well, yeah. The, yeah, the model is so complex that it fits the data mm -hmm. very, very well. So if it fit the data very, very well in training, uh, uh, then it may not fit the data in test set very, very well. Mm -hmm. But it fit the data on training very, very well. Very so this, well yeah. Yes. So look at this is what is happening. So here you can see um, the concept of um, underfitting the accuracy is that, but here you can see this is a sweet spot, what we want. Sweet like, spot. Yeah, mm -hmm. the optimal, that mm -hmm. is where we what, what you yes. want. But yes. here as the model complexity increase, can you see maybe here this, uh, there is no complexity, but this as the model yes. complexity increase, increase, mm -hmm. increase, mm -hmm. increase, then you will have overfitting. Over yes. And the model is generalizing very, very well. It's, gen it's learning yes. very, very mm -hmm. well. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So yes. what we want in machine learning is this sweet spot where mm -hmm. the model mm -hmm. learn enough that it generalizes stuff. But there are mm -hmm. issues to prevent. So what we want now in machine learning is how can we prevent underfitting and overfitting? And overfitting. That is a problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. How can yes. we prevent underfitting and overfitting so that we only mm -hmm. have um, the, the optimal the optimal performance? Yes. So that is why here we said 
overpeating and underpeating are the two biggest causes, biggest causes for performance mm -hmm. of machine learning algorithms. So oh, since they are the two biggest problem, what we want is how can we solve them? So who can tell yes. us the answer? How can we solve them? <laughs> how can we solve them? By having more data. Good example, good suggestion. Yeah. So mm -hmm. someone is saying they having more data. So relationship mm -hmm. of model complexity to data size. So you can mm -hmm. see now, it means there is relationship between your complexity of model and data size. Let's look at this one. Um, as I said, all this English is from the book. So you, I just pick it so that I summarize. So it is important to note that model complexity is intimately tied to the variation of input content in your training data set. The larger mm -hmm. variety data point you are data time, the more complex a model you can use without overfitting. Mm -hmm. So um, here, for example, we have a small data set. We have a small number of data set, like 20, um, uh, for example, um, 200. And I use a model which is so complex, yes. then it will overfit the data set. Yes. Because yes. the data is so small and the model is very powerful with um, powerful, it does yeah. is so yeah. complex, what I mean, then it will overfit the data mm. and fail to generate. So the pro to overcome yes. this problem is to have what? Mm. More data. More yeah. The larger the variety of data point you are data set when the more complex a model you can. So you can use even complex model if you have variety of data. What do you mean by variety of data? So this is another thing. What we mean by variety of data is this. So for example, if I have a data set um, with, uh, uh, with someone, like uh, I want to classify uh, someone whether uh, he is um, diabetic or not. So I collect the data set of 10 people. And now this data set of uh, information about 10 people, I replicated it into a million times. Is this large data set or small data set? It's large. It's small. Eh? It is small. It is small. Small. Because, it's because. Same thing. Oh my God. Um, so what I'm saying is this. Um, I want to classify people into uh, whether they, um, uh, maybe they have cancer or not. But I collected the data set of 10 people. Okay. Now I, I, multi I replicated this data set of 10 people into 1 billion. Is this large data set or small data set? The small. Why? The small record. It's the same data. Eh? It is the same data. It's the same data, right? Yes. So this is small data. It I'm cannot. Never... This is small data. It will not prevent your model from overpitting complex domain. So what we want in the data is variety of data points. Who can tell me what is the meaning of data point? What is data point? Who can tell me what is data point? Eh? Data point is the rule. Each yeah, what? Each exactly. Exactly. So it means that samples, right? Samples in your yes. data set. Samples. So it means when you have 1 billion data that you replicate from 10 examples, that is not a large data set. You just replicated. What we want is variety of data point. So if you observe this guy is 10 point, this, 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 different point different observation not the same observation that is what will uh, so usually collecting more data point will yield more variety so ledger data set allow will do more complex model however simply duplicating the same data point or collecting very similar data will not help so having more data and building appropriate more complex model can often work wonders for supervised learning tax so what this is telling us who can explain this Yeah, we should have more data for, for our training. Yes, this is just simple. So if you want to get good results for machine learning, get more data. Having more data and building appropriately more complex models can often work wonders for supervised learning tasks. In the real world, you often have the ability to decide how much data to collect, which might be more beneficial than tweaking and tuning your model. So if you don't have much data, one thing we do is to tweak our model. What do you mean by tweaking? Just to say, change some parameters, trying to fit the data. Um, but um, if you have much money, uh, use more data set. You don't need to even try to um, tweak your model. Um, yeah, so any question before we continue about uh, overpitting and underpitting? Do we understand the relationship between model complexity and the data size? Yes, sir. All right. So um, 
if we understand that, let's move on. Um, supervised learning algorithms. So um, it turns out that um, um, the machine learning algorithm is not only one. There are many tons of machine learning algorithms. So you need to select one that actually um, fit your preference. Yes, so here, um, as I already mentioned in this book, we are using top-down approach of learning. And um, what we mean by top-down approach of learning is this. We are not actually, so for example, if we want to, um, uh, we, we want to learn how to uh, play football. Um, do we, uh, uh, not, not that example, I want to give an example uh, of top-down uh, approach. So a top-down approach is a learning approach where we just start learning from what you want. So for example, now somebody wants to learn football, he doesn't need to go to class and sit down and write, okay, what is offside? What is, um, uh, what is the definition of ball? What is a uh, goalkeeper? No. The offside, the top-down approach, just go into the field and start playing football. So that is called top-down approach. Uh, so this book is using top-down approach. We will just use off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm. Um, um, we just use the off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm. What I mean is we are not now trying to see the conflict uh, mathematical behind that. We will go on, we will cover that in the next session of our book. But here we'll just pick the algorithm we want to use. So if I say we want to use KNN, we may not need go to go and see the mathematical stuff. If we say we'll see S, uh, SPM, vector machine, we may not see the mathematical. So, yeah. So having said that, um, we will now review the most popular machine learning algorithm and explain how they learn from the data and how to make prediction. We'll examine the strength and weakness of each algorithm. So these are the stuff we will do. We will examine the strength and weakness of each algorithm. And also we'll be able to explain the meaning and most important parameters option. So uh, each algorithm has what we call parameter. So for example, what I said is um, for each algorithm, maybe there is a parameter that you can tweak. Uh, there is what we call tuning tuning your model, to tune your model. So for example, if I train a machine learning model and it does not work well, so there are some parameters that you can tune. When we say tune, for example, you have your radio, you can tune that radio to move to the channel, tune the radio to move to BBC, tune it to move to um, CNN. That is called to, when you have model, your machine learning model, you can tune it to get better, tune it to get a little better, tune it to get a little better, Tune it to desired prediction accuracy you have. So if you are tuning your radio, you use your hand right to change to channel, to change to channel, you press. But in machine learning algorithm, to tune machine learning algorithm is to change some parameters. You add some parameter in algorithm. You say, ah, use this one. When you see that it's good, okay, you add another parameter. That is called tuning your model. Yes. Do you understand what is the meaning of tuning your model? Yes. So that, that is called tuning your model. Um, so uh, we'll see how you can, so different, but um, not all algorithms, um, uh, not all algorithms um, have the same parameters that you will tune. So each algorithm, so we, we need to know each algorithm and the parameter to tune it. You understand what I'm saying? So because each algorithm has different kind of parameters, so we need to know which algorithm, each algorithm separately, and we know parameters to train it, and that we will learn in this session. So we have some questions in this channel. Uh, how do I know the size of data needed for a simple tax? Ah, okay. So uh, she's asking, how do I know the size of data needed for a simple tax? Um, so for example, she's asking, do I need 2,000? Do I need 3,000? Do I need 5,000? Is that your question? Uh, we have Noor is asking this question. Yes, sir. That's the question. So, Thank you. yeah. So she's asking, how much data do I have? So, um, the more data I can see you have, the more the beta, the more the beta. But if there is no like a clear cut, say this, you need two thousand, you need one thousand, you need three thousand, you need four thousand. Just the intuition is, when you have more data, you will have more good results. Yes. And the data set, it depends because there are some kind of um, um, 
um, uh, uh, restriction in some field, you may not have a good data set. For example, a medical field in stuff like that, you may not have a different data set. Uh, so if you don't have a large number of data sets, sometimes that's what we call um, data argumentation. So data argumentation is something like this. So if I have a data set, which is 10,000, for example, and I need to train machine learning and I need large number of data set. So you can do what is called data argumentation. Um, if I have an image of somebody, uh, this is to give you an example. I have an image, someone is standing. It's a person, right? Now you can do what is called data argumentation to create multiple data. So if somebody is standing, I can change his orientation. I can change his, if he's standing, I can change his orientation. I can change the size, the pixel size. I can change the, um, the, a lot of stuff from the picture so that it will look like different. So there are many approaches to multiplicate your data. So previously we said that when we duplicate data of the same data set, um, it's not like we are creating the same data set but that, because there is no variety. But when you have a data set, but you change some stuff in the data for each one, and you multiply that number, then you, you have multiple variety. So that's why I give an example now, when you want to maybe detect an image of a cat and you don't have multiple images. So you can change the orientation of the cat to different orientations. This is one of the technique called data argumentation. So um, yeah, data. let's look at data argumentation, argumentation. So this is one technique that um, data argumentation Ah, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Yeah. The, yeah. So um, we will come to that. Just just give you an example. Let's move on. So many algorithms have a classification and a regression problem. I also may mention this. Many classification have classification and regression variant, and we'll describe both in the near future. So what this is saying is that. Um, you can see an algorithm in machine learning and they said it's classification. In some instance, you can see that they say it's B regression. Don't scare. Yes, they can also do both classification and regression, but they will have different uh, parameters to do. If it is classification, it may have different parameters. If it is regression, it may have different parameters. Any question before we go on? Any question? Right. If there is no question, we can move on. So before we go on in this, because like um, we need, before you do machine learning, you remember, we say we need to frame the problem. And the second thing, you need to get your data, right? So before we start learning some of the machine learning algorithm, uh, the book presents some kind of sample data set or when we say a toy data set, it means a data set used in machine learning just for learning, for learning. That is our called toy data sets. Or, um, uh, an example. So whenever you see a toy data set, I mean example. So we will use several uh, data set that the books come from with that are used for um, machine learning. So some of the data set will be small and synthetic. So that is what we call um, synthetic data set. So um, um, what I mean by synthetic data set is this. Sometimes you may not even have a data set to do some stuff, but you can have a machine learning to automatically create data for you, that is called synthetic data sets. They are not real data set, but they are just synthetic data set. Uh, so I think there is website for uh, mostly, I think, yeah. So this website, um, this, so uh, mostly that I, I think, right? So if you don't have a data set, you can create the data set synthetically. They are not real data set, but they are just like um, imitate the real and they are generated using machine learning as well. You know what I mean? So you can see generate now. So let's look at the synthetic data. What is synthetic data? Synthetic data is AI generating version of real data. Does that make sense? AI algorithm learn the pattern and dimension of data. Once they were trained, they can generate infinite amount of synthetic data. So um, if you want to do like training, um, maybe image um, for cancer and you don't have data, then you can come here. Uh, you can create a synthetic data and that synthetic data will behave like a real data. But there are some studies, um, this is a real, this is somehow um, um, uh, another uh, study on its up where how synthetic data works and stuff like that. So there are many papers, research paper, you can, um, uh, synthetic data, synthetic data sets, um, bias. 
So uh, introducing family of Zen data, so you can see there are many stuff like that. How can Zen data solve the AI bias? Because there is some kind of bias in AI, but um, creating synthetic data may, yeah. So that this is something called synthetic data. So the book will use synthetic data. The data set is make up, it's no real data set from the psychic line. So let's look at um, um, this kind of synthetic data the book will use. Uh, the book, uh, the, the data set comes from uh, scikit -Learn. Um Let me copy this and show you. So you see, we are using scikit -Learn. So these are the data sets that we'll be using. Um, Boston data set, um, Iris data set, we have seen diabetes data set. So these are the data sets we'll be using. Diabetes. Uh, hello? Yeah, so, so this, these are the uh, synthetic data set that we'll be using uh, to do some, uh, to learn machine learning. So let's move on. So um, I, I, um, an example of uh, a um, synthetic data, um, right, um, we will see now example of two synthetic data and real data set. So before we start learning the machine learning, uh, doing those algorithms, the, uh, we want to introduce some data sets that will be useful, that will use them as an example to train machine learning, to learn machine learning. But we will use two data sets. Um, the first uh, two are synthetic, the two, second two are real data sets. So the first one is called, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, Forge data set. Um, here is how to load the data set. Uh, this uh, MGLAN is a package that comes with the book. This is not part of scikit-learn. You need to install this package, MGLAN. So let me show you. Uh, if you want to, uh, action to machine learn with PyTorch, no, with PyTorch, with Python. Andrew Muller, GitHub. So if you come to this GitHub repository, you can see for you to run this book, to uh, install this book and do machine learning, you need to install packages. You can see that. Um, these are Scipid, Matplotly, Scikit-Learn, Pandas. When you install Jupyter, uh, when you install Anaconda, all of this one I install. But there is specific one that may not be installed. Uh, uh, which is the the package comes with the book. Which one is that? Uh, MGLAN, I think. Is it here? Mm -mm. Oh, I didn't see it here as well. Right. So, in, in any way, you need to install that package. Um, okay, let me. So you see, this is a package. Um, yeah, you need to install this one. Um, uh, how can you install it? Uh, there is, I think there was an error when you try. Uh, you can see uh, how can I, someone was asking, there's a question here. How can you install MGLAN? So for you to install MGLAN, you follow this step. Uh, if you are using Quanda, uh, or if you are using PIP, then or just install uh, PIP, PIP install MGLAN, then you be able to, but if you are using Quanda, first install PIP. If you don't have PIP, then you install it this way. Um, so um, even if you have Anaconda installed, then this will not actually, uh, you will not be able to import the data. So you need to install this one separately. Uh, the package was actually created mainly because of this book so to do some kind of example. So here we want to uh, just show you that um, this example of this data is synthetic data, they just use the data. So here you can see we say mgland.dataset, it is from what is called data set, make porch. So here we are downloading the data set because here this is the MG line. I already called this one, uh, the data the, and I assigned this. So here you can see X is the training and Y is what tested. So when you call this one, then it automatically assigned the train, the uh, features to X and uh, uh, what do you call the target to Y. And here we float the, we plot the, uh, futures, you can see it here. So here 
we have the second future here, we have the first future. So here, this is uh, an example of one data set that we'll use from MGLAN. Uh, just to show you the data set um, to know what it is. Uh, so here is actually using um, matplotlib to do uh, plotting. So here, plt. That, so let me start from here. This is a cloud discrete disk. Uh, discrete scatter because this is the data set. We create discrete scatter and this is a legend. Legend, uh, we put the legend here, some stuff like that. And this is the X level and Y level also. Um, if you have not uh, know the matplotlib, I will also share some kind of um, tutorial you can go about it. So here you can see we can also look at the shape of the data. So this data, MGLAN that we import, what is the number of how many? samples do we have? How many features do we have? Who can tell us? There are two features. So okay, there are two features, right? How many how many instances do we have? Is it not two? How many oh, examples? 26. Yes, 26. When we call yes, when we call X the shape, whenever we call shape on any training data, it will give us two um yes, something like this uh, in two dimensions. The first one is the instances, right? Or we call of the abation. Where yeah, exactly all the record. The second one is the what futures, right? The second one is the future. So this is just to show you the data set. This is the second future, the second future, first future, this second, and this is the first future. Um, as you can see, as the shelves, this data set contains 26 data points with two futures, right? Um, when we see the X, let's look at the S. What is the value of X? Can you see this is the X? Because we have two, right? Uh, but this is one, two, three, up to 26, right? And how many futures, two, right? Um, so this can, you can see future one, this can future two. So this is um, an example of the data set we see, um, but this is the target, which is Y. And the target, who can tell me the size of the target? How can the size of, the, what would be the size of the target? 26. 26. It will also be 26. Okay, yes. let's look. okay it will also be 26. Can you see it will it is also because it must be of what of the same size. So what we are telling here is that um, given the two features, the first one, the equivalent answer is what one. So what this is telling me us is that uh, uh, let's take the note of one the value one here. The value what first value here is one. So what is telling us that if we have this future, we have this future, then the answer is what? What is the target? One. <laughs> one. One, yes, example. So when we have the second future, this line, then the target value um, is this one, is zero, right? So we have 26, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, so that is what it means. So this is just to show you the data set. We are not doing anything, mm -hmm. just understand this is the, the first data set we'll be using. Then uh, we use scatterplot here, right, to show, can somebody tell us what is the use of scatterplot? Why do we use scatterplot? Scatterplot is used um, for visualization and um, mostly when we have um, just two, um, two features. Exactly. And then we use scatterplot. Exactly. Good. Excellent. So um, scatterplot, she said, is used when we have two features. So you can see here how many features do we have two, right? The first one and second one. So when you want to visualize your data set, as we learn um, you, before you when doing data processing, we can use scatterplot to, just to visualize to see the data set, how it looks like. The first thing you can do if you have two, two features is to use scatterplot. You can see the main purpose of scatterplot is to show how strong relationship or correlation between two variables. The tighter the data point fall along a state line, the higher the correlation is. Um, so. Um, but also the variable we use for scatterplot relationship between two numeric variable. So you can see here uh, the two variable in X that we plot here, uh, that we plot, 
uh, the x you can see here is x the first x and here the the first column of the x and here the second column can you see that so when we have um futures uh, when we when we want to use scatter plot the relationship of the two variables must be what numerical so when you have categorical you cannot use scatter plot we use numerical the dot in the scatter plot not only report the value of individual but also pattern so let me show you what is the meaning of uh, let's look at scatter plot scatter plot so that is why they said there is some kind of in, uh, interesting between statistic and machine learning and different so this is a scatter plot so what is telling us here we have one point here we have another variable here so when we uh let me show this so what is this is saying is this uh okay here you have a height you have you have a diameter now for example when you have a diameter of four, what is the height? It's 3.3. When you have diameter of six, what is the height? Is this. When you have diameter, you put you so you can see you have many diameter, you have many height. So this is called scatter plot. Now it shows you the relationship. What who can tell us which kind of relationship now do we have between height and diameter? It seems linear. Eh? It looks like linear relationship. So we, in scatter plot, we have two kinds of relationship: positive relationship, negative relationship, and uh, which one is called the other one. So here is positive. What we mean here is as diameter increases, then height increases. Can you see as diameter increase? Can you see the diameter, the height increase? This is called positive relationship when it is moving like this. But there, there is scatter plot that shows negative relationship, like this one. This is called negative relationship, scatter plot. This means that as process in input increases, the this quality increases. As process increases, quality increases. Can you see that? This is called negative. So scatter plot show you the relationship between two variables. That is the main aim of scatter plot. Can you see that? Uh, the main purpose of scatter is to show how strong the relationship or correlation between two variables. So that is what we call correlation. This means that there is correlation between this and this variable because as this one increases, this one decreases. Then there is correlation. Can you see that? This one also that we see, as diameter increases, then height will increase. It, it means these two variables, they are correlated. There is correlation between them. Do you see that? Then it means that uh, our machine learning can learn since there is a relationship between these two points. So this is just an example. Um, this is, uh, I sh I when I share this one, um, this is a good uh, place to see because we have different kind of um, uh, plots. Uh, just we now see um, scatter plot that is used to show uh, between two data set, two point, which your correlation, but there are many kind of uh, uh, plots. Uh, I will share this link. With this link, we can actually know different kind of uh, plot we can have. So, for example, this is data visualization exploratory plot. You can see what is the meaning of this uh, different kind of plot, plot types. Okay, we have histogram. When do we use histogram? When do we use density plot? When do we use scatter plot? This is the example. Scatter plot are helpful when you have numerical values for two different pieces of information. Numerical for two different pieces, and you want to understand the relation between those pieces of information. So you can see, you can understand. So this is, um, you see, there are a lot of uh, stuff like that. So I will share this so that you will un understand that. Um, um, the, another data set will be used is um, uh, example to show example of regression using another synthetic data. So this is a data set uh, here also to use, um, we show that uh, using that. Just, uh, so here we are plotting, if I change this one here, maybe to use this, we can, So this is another data set will be used. Um, just take a note of the data set, we will come over to it. Now, how do we decide what we input, what we put on X and Y axis in scatter plot? Who can answer this question? Now, if I have this uh, two data point, how can I decide what will be on Y? What can be on X? Who can answer this question? Who can answer this question? The defendant. Eh? Eh? So um, in scatter plot, in scatter plot, we put the target. 
and here are the futures. <laughs> Look at the DTI. Futures are here. So what does this mean? You know, what is dependent variable? What is independent? If you remember, dependent variable is the target, right? Independent variable are the futures. Is that correct? Yes. So, yes. What, so, so here is this. The independent variable should be plotted on the x-axis. The dependent variable, the one affected by the independent variable should be plotted on y-axis. So for example, um, I have like, um, uh, I want to predict the um, house prices, right? So maybe I have different future for the house, I have house future. The maybe uh, it has three toilet, it has, um, uh, uh, it is in the city and I want to predict the price. So the price I want to predict is, should be on y-axis. That is, is 2 million, is 3 million, is 5 million. The more, the more here room you have, for example, I have one room, I have two room, I have three room, I have four room, I have five room, I have six room, I have seven room. Then when I have this, when I have one room, then maybe the point will be here. It will not be. But when I have two room, maybe the, the cost will be here. So you can see that the target, the result, which is called dependent is always on the y axis. But in, uh, so this is something that I, I just want to show, let you know to understand how this works. In the above plot, we plot the single future on the x axis and the regression target on the y axis. So always the, reg the target is always on the y axis and the futures are uh, stuff on the x axis. Any question before we continue? These are some stamps you need to make. No. We also have what is called low dimension data set and high dimension data set. You should also know when we have low dimension data set, a data set with two, uh, a data set with few features is called low dimensional data set. If a data set is low dimension, like two features, then we can use um, scatter plot to plot it. But when a data set is high dimensional, we cannot use scatter plot. We use other stuff like that. So there is another terms you should know this. This um, uh, but with a data set with low dimension, uh, we can understand it better. We can float here and look at what is happening before we even train our machine learning model to understand if the machine can understand. So these are some terms you also need to know, um, uh, low dimension and um, high dimension. So now we have seen the uh, uh, synthetic data set. Um, let's look at some of the real world data set that will be used. So just to recap what we are doing, we are showing now samples of the data set that will be used in the next uh, sessions that we'll be using. So we now see two synthetic data set. What we mean by synthetic data set, data set that are not real, they are just created. So this is the first one, and uh, this is the second one. Uh, first one, this is the second one. So we have seen the two which are synthetic. Now let's look at the real data set that will be used um, in the uh, next session. The re two real data set will be used um, which are the first one is with conscious data sets. And this real data set that will be used, uh, they are from scikit-learn. So this synthetic data set that we'll see, they are not from scikit-learn, as you can see, but they are just from this packet, mg-learn, right? Uh, mg-learn, so from this class. But what we will see, this data set, they come from scikit-learn. Um, so these are some of the, but for you to use this, those data set from scikit-learn, you need to import them. How can you import data set from scikit-learn? You can say from scikit-learn, the data set, that is from the data set, import this load, uh, load breadth cancer. Can you see, import this class? It means we have a, a data set class in module in scikit-learn, then from that module, import this data set. Now, from this data set, remember if you thought, um, imported, we now to create an object of this data set. So this is how you create object in um, in Python. We call this class and we open two braces and this is the object we have. This object is called, um, it now contains the data set we'll be using. Uh, maybe some people, uh, anybody confused on this step? If you are confused, just let me know. I can explain better uh, because we learned this from our Python class. Are you confused on how you can create object object from class? If you are confused, no. let me. Huh? No, there is no confusion. Yes, for you, um, Ba. I, think I have a question. Yes. Uh, about can we uh, when we have very low data set, 
Mm -hmm. Can we use synthetic database to augment our real world database? Yes. Yes, that is some research. That is, in fact, some research don't even use with real data sets. They use of synthetic data at all. Gaba air research now. So, yeah. So, yeah, this is research consumption. So, um, so this is, we create an object called cancer. Uh, so now let's look at how we can use this. So this means that our object cancer now contain the data set. So let's look at this. So here, uh, let me show you this. And so here it means for us to see what is whatsoever in that data set, we'll call this object and now call some functions. Um, this is object oriented we do. So the keys here will show us what is inside the data set. So this data set has like uh, data target, frame, target name, and description of the data. Right, so here this is um, called, uh, every, we want to make this is uh, clear, data set that I included in cycle are usually stored in an object called bunch object. So here the object we created called cancer is called a bunch object, uh, which contains some information about the data set as well as the actual data. So it contains the information about the data set and the actual data. So here, these are the actual data. For example, the target, the target names, and the future names. These are, but this is description about the data. So the, the bunch object contains information about the data and also the data itself. All you need to know about bunch object is that they behave like dictionary. So this is a good point. If you know Python dictionary, then you are good. Yes. So the only difference is that with the betting field is that in Python dictionary, when we want to assess the key, the element in the keys in dictionary, we can use bunch, then we call the key in braces. But in bunch object, the addition is you can just say the objects, then you call the key. Then you will have the, let me just give you an example. So here is this. Uh, okay, let's look at the shape of the data. Cancer the data. So look at, the, this is the data. Let's look at the data. Cancer. So if I want to see the data, because cancer is the object, I want to assess the data key. Because we said that the object is like dictionary. In dictionary, we use dot to assess the uh, object. So let's look at this. Can you see the data? Can you see this is the data? These are the data. But we can also use it to send uh, the object. We can also use the same shape to find the shape of the data. Right? Um, so you can see here we have. Now the data set here has how many rows, how many observations does it have? Five, six, nine. And how many features we have? 30. 30. So this is the cancer data set that we'll be using. Now, what are the targets? So you can see for you to see the target of the data set, we can say, okay, we can call this object cancer and now use the dictionary like to see the target. You can see that, okay, it tells you the target we have malignant and benign. So the cancerous, given uh, some future, it will be able to classify into oh, benign, okay. malignant or benign. But um, we can use two ways. As I said, the bunch object allow you just to call the target's name using dot. So we can say cancer, the target name. So you can see we have the same thing. So these are the malignant and the benign. So this is a data set that we can use. But what are the futures? So you can also call the cancer, the object, and you call the future. Look at it here. These are the keys right these are the keys so we can call the futures here uh, future names so we can see these are the future so what do we mean this given any image there is mean radius there is mean texture there is mean parameter there is mean area mean smoothness mean compactness these are the 30 future for image given a single image there is these futures without a latin this information without a latin about one image these are the information that will be able to tell whether an image is either uh, malignant or what? benign. Benign. Yes. So how, mal how many malignant and benign do we have? So let's look at how many those stuff we have. We have like malignant is 20, 212 and benign is 357. So you can see that the data set here is not balanced. Like the, we have more benign and stuff like that. That is the first data set. The second data set we see is Boston data set. We are running out of time. And also it's the same data set, but this data set is used, uh, is also real world data set that will be used for regression. So we, are, we will use these data sets to predict the price of house of in Boston. And um, 
what actually, let's look at. So for you to use the data set, you need to load uh, from scikit-learn the import Boston. Can you see that? And now we create an object mm -hmm. called Boston. Boston. Yes, yeah, so let's run this one. We have an object called Boston. Now, what is the shape of the data set? Let's run it, this one, Boston, the data, the shape. So we have 506, uh, 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 what do you call it? Data point. data point. And we have how many uh, features? 13. 13, right? So, um, but uh, this guy, there is some stuff. Uh, the, we have 13 features, but uh, you remember we, we, we download this data set from SKLR, right? But he wants to use what is called um, interactions. We'll explain this one bit far. He want to add one future, one future, make it from 13 to 14. So he used his okay. package called MGLAN to extend the data set, which is uh, now we have it contains 104, not 103. So the data set we will be using for Boston data set is having 104 features and 506 observations. This is just explanation of the data set. We'll, don't worry about the data set. This is just to show us to know which kind of data set we will we'll use. We'll import each data set when we come to that. So any question? Before we continue, any question? Any question? Now, um, let's summarize what we did. So now we have seen that um, we have um, uh, in supervised learning, we have two kind of uh, uh, tasks, regression or classification. And uh, regression is predicting continuous value. And regression is uh, uh, classification is predicting some kind of categorical value. But we also that classification falls into two. We have a binary classification where we do like a or bad, excellent, something like that. But we have multi-class where we have different kind of classes. Um, but also we have seen that, okay, now before we move on, uh, we, uh, we have also seen what is called um, uh, generalization. What do we mean by generalization? When we say data, our model generalized, it means the model uh, learn very well, right? Um, that is what we want. That is called generalization. Uh, but we also understand what is overpitting and underpitting. Underpitting one model doesn't perform well. One, we say, oh, this is overpitting, not overpitting. This is the correct one. Um, right, that is overpitting. But we also understand the relationship between complexity of the model and the data set. The more data you have, the more you will be able to use more complex models to train your data. So more complex model try to fit the data very well. So if you have more data, you can use more complex model to make your prediction much better without trying to tune your model. Um, so we have seen that uh, we can use uh, different kind of uh, models. For example, we have classification. Uh, a classification algorithm can be used for both uh, uh, regression and classification, but they may have different kind of parameters. So here we have seen now the lastly, that uh, before we start doing machine learning, we will see the kind of data set that we'll be using as a sample. Uh, we discussed the first two, which are synthetic data set or toy data set, which are just created, they are not real, and we have shown them. Don't worry, we'll come back to them each one when we want to do any machine learning algorithm. We also seen um, what is scatter plot. A scatter plot is used to actually visualize two point, and we also seen that. Um, uh, what is independent and dependent variable and which variable we put. We put a uh, target, uh, which is dependent and independent here. We also understand what is low dimensional data set and high dimensional data set. A low dimensional data set is one with few features, um, a high dimension with large features. We have also seen that, um, uh, that um, we will use real data set from scikit-learn, which are two with constant data set. And this is how you can load the data set. And the last one is, um, what we have seen just recently, which is Boston data set. But Boston data set at the end, it has 13 features, but the book, the author of the book, extend the features to 14, um, which we have this. That is what we have discussed. Um, now, uh, I think it is time to just see the, uh, we have nine minutes to go, uh, but we will now try to train, uh, if possible, one machine learning algorithm to see how it works. Or if, if we don't do that, then we can uh, meet next week and continue. So. Now we have seen different kind of data set we will use. Let's move on to the first one. Uh, what we will look at now is called nearest neighbor. Okay, nearest neighbor um, to try to start our training machine learning model. 
We also said we have many kind of machine learning algorithms. The first one we see is the simplest one. Always start with simple, right? Before you go to the complex so stuff. So, um, KNRS neighbor is the simplest machine learning algorithm, and it assumes that similar thing exists in close proximity, and other similar things are near to each other. So, what uh, KNRS neighbor algorithm does? So, what KNRS neighbor algorithm does is this: If I have this data set, um, I have this one, right? I have this data set, and I have now my I, I train a model using this data set, and now I bring another model, uh, another test set, and I have this point. Now it will try to find what are some points close to it, near to it. If I have this is near to my date point, then I will say it's, it fall into this class. If I have my point it here, and uh, I want to classify if it belongs to there, I say it fall into this class. We'll see the detail of it uh, uh, in a bit. So um, KNRS neighbor is easy to implement, supervised machine learning algorithm that can be used to solve uh, both classification problem. Yes, so it will be used, can be used for both classification and regression. It finds samples geographic neighborhood to predict the samples classification. So this, this is just example. Let me just give you a high level example. Um, so I want to find someone who is like a um, bandit. Uh, in Nigeria, I want to classify people that are bandits. And uh, I have um, many people here uh, sit down. And I identify that um, this guy, Mr. A, is bandit. And um, what I identify is since this guy is bandit, then it is probably the person next sitting close to him that they always move together is also a bandit. So that is the assumption of Kenyaris neighbor. It assumes that what is close to you, you belong to the same class. Now, this example that I give, I said the first Mr. A is a bandit, and someone close, sitting close to him in Hanan Damansa is a bandit. Then Kenyaris example will say, okay, this guy is a bandit. All of the two are bandit. Lump them together. That is, in this case, we use this K, nearest neighbor. K means the number of neighbors you have. But in this case, I use K, only one neighbor. But maybe a hanandamans, a bayan, a hanandamans, a quite another person. So when I say I want to use K nearest neighbor with two K, it means I want to find the nearest neighborhood. I find the hanandamans, the Dick Banditney, uh, 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 I mean, the uh, Dick Banditney, then I can say Mr. A, and then the second Shima is bandit because two people around him are bandits. So K means the N number you want to make your decision where whether something belongs to a particular class or not. So K and N for classification predict a new sample using the idea of similarity or closest sample from the training set. So you train, you have your data set. Yes. You have your data set. You train the data set. When you train the data set, then you have a new sample. You want to classify that sample. Then you look at the training sample. What is the closest features that that sample has with those that you train? then the closeness is determined by K. K, it means one that is closest to it. Two, it means two that is close. So that is mean here you can have like one, here you have like two. Can you see that the closest point, for example, I have this point, I have this one, like one here. You can see like this one, I have another point. I have this two closest three. I have this one here, the closest three. Then if the closest three here, two are, uh, three here, all the three here are this class. Uh, we can say it belongs to this. But here you can see two are uh, closest, but one, um, two are most closest. Then we can say we can take the majority board. Then we can say it belongs to this class. Um, so what this algorithm does, this is how the algorithm, but how can it determine the nearest neighbor? 
it uses what is called a clearly dis many distance. So how can we determine what is closer to this? We use a distant formula, which is called, uh, we know uh, we did what is called Euclidean distance, right? Euclidean. Yes, we use Euclidean distance in our secondary school, right? Yes. Uh, so let us see, all oh, right, uh, let me show us something. How the model shows the distance. So there are many ways to determine the distance between the points. Um, you can see distance between two points. This is the uh, Euclidean distance, right? Um, where yes. you use this to determine the distance between two points. Uh, but you can see, you know that in mathematics, there are different ways to uh, determine the distance. So for example, this is if you have two points, you can use Euclidean distance. What about if you have end point? So there are many um, formulas or many ways to determine the distance. So that is why we said here, example of those distance is, um, what is um, mean cos key distance, uh, how cal to calculate the distance. So this, uh, you don't need for now, we don't need to know the distance, but uh, our algorithm that we'll use will automatically calculate that. So building the model consists of only storing the training data set. So KNN, what it does is that if you want to train a model, just train the data set, uh, train the model, what will the model will do? It will just store the data set. KNN. If you want to build model with KNN, just build the model, it will store the data set. When it store the data, training data set, then when you have a new data, it will try to find the distance between those training and the new data. And now we'll estimate the probability how near uh, you have. You have. Uh, I think we have two more minutes. So um, here we will see, uh, uh, we, uh, okay. So I think we can stop here. We will continue from uh, KNN, we'll see this is, uh, we'll continue how we can train a KNN algorithm. Uh, just the same way we show uh, last time how we do that. Um, but uh, we are running out of time. I think we can stop here and uh, continue explanation from uh, KNN algorithm. So to summarize, now we have seen um, uh, the kind of data set we'll be using. And also we have seen um, what classification are, different kind of classification. And um, what we'll uh, start working on in the next week is just to start going on into different kind of uh, algorithm for classification. We'll continue from K nearest neighbor. And yeah, any question before we close? Um, any question? So uh, if you look at this, this the we this what I'm doing is chapter two. If you look at it here, um, you can see the book. Uh, start from, yeah, so look at it, you can see K nearest neighbor, right? Um, there are many algorithms, so we'll continue. We have K nearest neighbor, linear model, naive by decision tree, ensemble decision tree, kind of light support vector machine. So this is what we'll do. Um, so um, you can read them to understand more, but also um, uh, as the book suggests here, uh, you can also read these chapters that the book suggests not the book, uh, the course. Okay, I closed that one already. Yeah, so um, any question before we go on? Ask question. Hello, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, alaikum yes. alaikum salam. Yeah, sir, my own is not a question, but it's a kind of request. Right, yes. Some of us are about to make their proposals for the C research. Yes. And uh, I, in the course of your explanation, you have made mention of model tuning and stuff like that, mm -hmm. which I think I, uh, my, my request is that in that, in the process of that explanation, mm -hmm. if there is any tune that one can do and get a contribution for an MSc research, please help us and highlight it to us because we are now starting this machine learning with the hope to conduct our research and make a contribution for the award of our MSc. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. Right, so um, I think what we should do that, um, if you have any question, just um, um, message me in the Slack, in the uh, inbox me privately. Uh, yeah, you, you know, in Slack, you can write message to individual person. So in the Slack, mm -hmm. you can write a message to me and ask me anything you want. I can give you a guide. That is the purpose we are doing here um to learn together and uh, yeah i'm happy to um, answer your question or give you suggestion regarding your research or something like that yeah if i know yeah so I, i'm happy to do that Thank any question yes any question again um, right. sir, can i add to what you just said now sir yes 
Okay. Um, as regards uh, research, mm -hmm. what so far what we have been doing here is that there are the tools that you require mm -hmm. for you to be able to carry out a machine learning exactly. research. Uh -huh. So um, for the person asking, mm -hmm. I think your first step should be that you should get papers, but it's review papers that is going to introduce you to you, introduce to you what the field entails and everything. And most of the time when you read those research, when you read those review papers, you'll be able to like one or two things. So that when you're messaging Malam, as, as he's telling you, you already understand what he's saying because it's quite hard grabbing these things. And uh, because you are doing MSc, your time is quite short. I don't know um, where you are doing it, but I know most of the time it's only like one year, one year, like at most two years. So if you, and if you don't do it on time, the timeline might be against you. So that's yeah. my advice for you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think um, what your question maybe was saying, um, you are trying to um, praise what the contribution you are trying to do for the MSC, right? Maybe what you yes, can, yes, sir. yeah. So that's a, you see, is a big question because, like, um, uh, it's not something just to say, okay, this is how you do it. Um, how you can find like um, um, a gap or pattern you want to contribute, you cannot just, um, example for today, I want to do like, um, um, I want to solve a problem or do some stuff. I cannot just say, I want to do that. Everything you need to learn for the, the single way, the first way for you is to learn from literature. You need to read papers. Just read papers. When you read papers on particular problem, for example, like you want to do like sentiment analysis, then you need to read papers. When you read some papers, like a review paper or some stuff like that, in those papers, you will see they said future contribution. Maybe at the end of the day paper, they will say future contribution. It means, do I not able to do that? Then you, you can think, ah, maybe I can do this. Then when you do that, then you solve the problem, you make contribution. Yes. So, so um, it's... One way to do that for, um, I mean, this is the idea. A good idea, listen to this. A good idea, a good idea. Let me write this. A good idea comes from many ideas. Hmm. So um, the, the thing is, a good idea comes from many ideas so you cannot just um you cannot just say look at one quote if you want to have a good idea you must have many ideas one, most of them will be wrong and what you have to learn is which ones to throw away you know the best way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas so what i mean what i'm trying to say here is this when you read papers a lot of paper you read this read this when you read this paper just take a point that they say they didn't do it take this paper they, they, then when you read a lot then you will have a best way to put things together and you will have what you call original thinking original lining so yeah creativity consists of coming up with many ideas not just that one great idea so you see the problem is this uh, you cannot just sit down and you say you want to solve your problem and you do not actually read. The reading is the solution. Do you understand? So what I will add you the simpler way, um, if you want to make a proposal and you want to uh, work on machine learning problem like head speech, sentiment analysis, get some review paper. That is the first step you want. So um, if you want to do that, okay, for you like from computing, what you need to do, go to here. Semantic scholar, for example, semantic scholar. Uh, okay, semantic scholar one. Not semantic scholar. Let me give you an example. You may also go to this one. Um, research rabbit. Do you know research rabbit, guys? No. Okay, this is fantastic. Okay, let me give you this one. So, this is research rabbit. Um, when I go to research rabbit, um, I have an account, uh, I can register. And uh, this is very interesting. Um, if you are, um, just wait for me for five minutes, let me show you some stuff here. Just wait. Guy, I want to send, okay, login. 
this is if you are doing research um nowadays you need to know this stuff because it will really okay you can you can see the guy knows me i think um let me log in hmm it's telling me uh He's saying he doesn't know me. Let me see again. All right, you don't know me? Okay, um, let me share my screen again. Uh, just wait for me a bit. Um, new tab. Okay, let me share another screen. Let me share screen. Just wait for me. This is very important. What I want, what I want to try to show you is really, really important. Um, let me show you. Okay. Um, you can see my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. So can you see I book I already bookmarked this page at the search rabbit. So let me open another one. Can you see I bookmark another page okay. called call another one called ACL? I want to show you my my uh, my stuff. Can you see I bookmark another page called paper Swiss code? Let me go to it. Um can you see I bookmark another uh, page called uh, citation gecko? Let me go to them. Let me just show you some a little bit of example. So let's go to the first one, research rabbit. Oh, the guy is so slow. My computer is so slow. Oh my goodness. Oh, that is why I don't want to use Chrome because the Chrome it will drink all your um, memory. Oh God. Okay. Is trying to open. So um, this one, so if you are doing like, oh, okay, ACL is for people that are working on the area of natural language processing, uh, NLP. So natural language processing, if you are working for like area that consists of um, this thing, uh, text, this is a website of, if you are working on NLP, this is the father of all the web, all thing. These are conferences that you target to submit paper, EMNLP, ACL, uh, for the last two, three weeks, I was at this conference. Uh, which one is that? Uh, EMNLP at uh, Punta Cana, Dominican Republic, um, in the North America. Um, okay, it, it doesn't go. Oh, okay. Oh, God, it's not showing. So maybe we can leave it, I think, next week, right? Uh, because it's time going on. So this website is called Papers with Code. What this is the meaning of these papers with code? So these papers of code, you can see like we can see browse state of the art. Now, I want to work, for example, um, oh God, right. So I want to work maybe on different kind of natural language. If you have a problem computer vision, natural language processing, uh, medical. So if I want to work on sentiment analysis, you can go here. I can go to sentiment analysis. And what this is it will give you is that, um, Papers with code is a website that shows papers with their code, implementation of their code, uh, the way they solve the problem. And uh, so you can see this is a center. So you can see like this is a paper, Robota, Robata, it used this. And this is like uh, the ranking, the trend. This is the best um, uh, classification result. If you will go to the GitHub, you see this is a paper, this is a GitHub. You see the result, you can do some kind of comparison. So you can see different kind of model. This is a data set. This is the models. Can you see that? Uh, XLNA, Robata. These are uh, deep learning models that are used now in, now today. You can see BAD. You can see different kind of data set. So these are the papers, greatest papers with code. You can see Electra, now different kind of model. You can see BAD. You can see, so you can look at this website. Um, if you want to like uh, train a model, you can learn from them. The mo mode is there. But also papers, if you want to see papers, oh, okay, I say for my uh, NLP, uh, these are conferences. So if I want to say, okay, I want to see um, paper on, okay, let me see NLP. This is the year 2021. This is the final year 2000. These are the years. So for example, this year, 2021, let me go on. So I say EMNLP 2021, uh, you will see, let me show you, you see a lot of, one good thing about this, these papers are free. And these are the top papers in the world if you are talking about NLP. So these are proceedings. So this conference proceedings, you look at, for example, now I'm working maybe on um, uh, what kind of uh, argument mining or uh, uh, different kind of problem. 
uh, you see that this is in the year 2021. So each conference or workshop has uh, papers in it. So if I'm working on sentiment analysis, you see like uh, there is some conference or workshop, you look at it, so a linguistic annotation. For example, I want to do annotation. I can go to all summarization. You can look at the paper. So if I uh, want, let me see another one. Argument mining. So maybe you are working on argument mining. You go here, argument mining. So you see all the papers on argument mining. Can you see all the papers here? Then when you click here, you will, it will give you the paper. So you can go and read the paper, get this. And how can you get state of the art? Now, for you to get the state of the art, it's like a paper that has been published in letters year 2001, 2000, 2000, 2000. Don't go and read paper that was published in 2010, 2005. So these are some of the stuff you can see a lot, but this is a cool thing, research rabbit. I want to show you right here. So this is research rabbit. Um, I was showing. Uh, so what this, what is this? Is good is this? Uh, let me remove this. So uh, I, I think I sent to um, uh, uh, Bilkis to this website and this one. So for example, this is a paper in review on sentiment analysis. Okay, let me remove. Okay, let me just add, uh, create something from new. So when you come to the search rabbit, what you can do is this, create a new collection. Name the collection, for example, sentiment analysis, sentiment. I say, okay. So I have another, uh, this sentiment analysis. So what you can do is add a paper. So um, what do you mean by add a paper? For example, I want to do um, sentiment, uh, head speech, head speech detection. Head speech detection. So for example, then you go, uh, you can go to semantic scholar. Okay, let me write semantic scholar, semantic scholar. This is also another semantic scholar. You go to semantic scholar. Don't go to Google now. Don't go to Google now and search uh, for paper. No, go to semantic scholar. This is a website now that you can search for our literature stuff um, because it's more intelligent than Google scholar as well. Don't go to Google scholar. Why I say this um, head speed detection, why I say this, more intelligent than Google Scholar, I will show you. You can create a free account. Uh, okay, let me sign and show you the, the, why I said this is more intelligent. Um, I think with my Google, uh, okay. Right. Okay, I, I think I signed it. So let me show you this head speech, I mean head speech speed detection. So uh, detection, maybe example, I want to see a paper and head speech. So you click here. <sighs> when you click here, and one interesting thing, this is free. This is free, uh, semantic scholar, semantic scholar is free. So you see this paper, um, head speed detection. Uh, one good thing is this. You can see the paper that cites this head speed detection. This is the citation and you can, order by different kind of relevance. For example, uh, by most influential paper, citation count, recency, how, of, uh, how soon the paper was published. You can, see, can you see that? Recency, can you see it changes to 2022? If the paper has PDF, you see PDF here. If it doesn't have, and you see a lot of stuff. So not only that, you can even create a dashboard where you can define your research. So if a new paper is released, you will get a lot, they will send you. So you, for example, I have different kind of, um, uh, you can see my feed, I have different kind of data, you can see that. This is where you can do that. So let, let me show you just the research a bit, if it, yeah. So uh, I, I, let me uh, take the name of the paper. Hmm. <sighs> okay, maybe, uh, Okay, let me see. Uh, okay, let me just put another name of the paper I have in mind. So just put the name of the paper here, sentiment analysis, sentiment analysis. May, let's assume this is the, the name of the paper, just search. So when you search, because this is one of the mo most influential paper for sentiment analysis. So let me add this paper. When I add this paper, so look at what will happen. Now, you can see I add this paper to this collection. You may have different many collections. So you can click on this paper. What will happen is you will see the 
abstract and you see um all the papers that cite this paper if this paper is good you will see all the papers that cite this paper so here is generating the citation of the paper uh, and here you can see similar paper if this paper is good you like it you can click here and see similar work similar related to this paper so you see these are the papers that cite this paper and you can filter them by recency how soon they were published not only recency by citation the paper that cite this paper most open you can resist many stuff like that so when you click this paper ah, I, ah you see okay this is a good paper you may see it it will open another place you can see the abstract you can read the abstract. if this paper is good then you can go and then ah if this is paper you can also see visualize it you can see stuff like that you can see you can visualize this paper what does that mean let's look at this you can see the papers that cite this paper you can okay you can just look at them here you can it will show you the title by year you can you can zoom in you can zoom out a lot of stuff so this is one good way for you to even look at many papers and um, do can some kind of stuff so um you can find similar work so for example i like this work for this author so i want to find similar work related to this person this title same thing and an opinion of mine so you can say give me similar work related to this person so here it will generate the similar works so can you see um it is generating similar works um here uh this uh, i mean this a lot of stuff so i will share a video that explain the details with you on how this research rabbit works this is an interesting way for you to actually find many research papers yeah i think we are running out late may if you have the uh if we have uh, you are interested we can spare a time just like 30 minutes or an hour so i will show you a lot of ways for you to do research and do uh, stuff like that and i told you like this also semantic scholar is one good thing um uh, sentiment uh, i mean papers with code is also another good way to find papers with code uh, citation gecko is also another thing that would show you which how many people they cite um yeah i think we can stop here and uh we can organize maybe some ways or days to look at this any question yes sir we'll be very grateful if you find time to put us through on how to get things done easily we'll be very happy about that sir yes yes so thank you very much sir so we can discuss in the slack um any question again all right just a suggestion i think this uh, this part how to get this uh, recent papers if you can let's say start our next week class with it it will be very helpful so i think what we suggest is um we all we normally start with uh, at two o'clock right so if it is okay we can meet like 1 30 for the first 30 minutes we can go over through this stuff to do some stuff like that so i can explain a lot for you yes any question again any question again all right um even if you have question you can message me on the slack or some other stuff uh, i think um we can we are running out of late and uh, see you all next week and uh please read the chapters of the book the more you read the book let me tell you this the more you read the book and the content the more you understand also don't just read try to do hands-on try to implement to practice with the code that is when you will understand, oh, oh, this is how this is. Oh, this is how this is. Oh, this is how this is. You forget, just you, we learn by doing. And if you find it trouble, like you, you cannot set something up, just ask question in the Slack, we'll be able to answer your question. And uh, if your uh, environment is not ready, try to ask, we can set it up. All right, see you all next week, bye-bye. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.